So here we are. Eat your backyard. Welcome to my YouTube channel. Where I take you with me on my journey to continue to make my backyard, front yard space into an edible paradise that will really be just a cool place to hang out with your family, something that your whole family, community is going to want to be part of. <clears throat> One of the things I did recently was I asked my youngest son, you know, he's a little guy going into sixth grade, and uh, I said, what's your favorite place? What's your favorite place? Is it the beach? Because we don't live far from the beach. <clears throat> is it the park? Is it, you know, all these different locations I named? And he said, no, it's the backyard. To me, that says it all. And that's the purpose of what I'm trying to share with the world by doing this channel. So glad you're with us. Thank you for jumping on the stream on this Sunday morning. It is a muggy, muggy morning. But, <clears throat> excuse me. Surprisingly, <clears throat> excuse me. I need to put on the clear your throat button before I do that. Sorry. But surprisingly, in the shade, it's not really that bad. Now, if you look up in this very delicate kind of <laughs> Jamaican cherry tree, can see that the leaves are blowing that way that direction is west good morning Gerald Franz always great to see you sir so glad you're on the stream stoked the stream just got better folks now you know, that west wind in the morning on the east coast of Florida as Gerald knows is quite typical this time of year Yes, and if you're watching this video now or even in the future, you get a lot of playbacks on these streams. People check in when they have availability. I don't do a very good job really scheduling them or facilitating the easy access to them because I just generally do them ad hoc. But Sunday mornings are generally the time I like to do it. But yeah, the pattern in Central Florida on the coast is very very predictable during the summer months now of course there's periods of change to that pattern <clears throat> every once in a while like you have a hurricane come through or a tropical storm big storm or little storm and that can alter it mostly is a either gentle to no wind in the morning or an offshore wind or a very light onshore wind but typically that's not the case and very clear skies, clouds way out over the ocean. And then throughout the day, the wind turns on shore, the clouds build up, then the rain rainstorms come. We usually get pretty heavy rains. They clear out and you could count on a little bit more lesser wind conditions in the evening. It cools off again. Very nice pattern, which I love. And without that rain, this is a desert right here. If you look at the, I'm in zone 10A. So if you look at the other places around the planet in zone 10A, you're gonna find desert after desert. Oh, thank you, Gerald. Yes, I appreciate that greatly. Yes, happy Father's Day to everybody on this stream or watching it who is a father. This is a good time to uh, point that out, not in some virtue signaling way, like maybe tempting, but I really, really fundamentally believe that our whole fabric of our society depends on parents doing their job. Mom, dad, whatever the situation is, but that they have two parent figures that are taking care of business and preparing those kids to be strong enough to exist in a world filled with chaos and succeed and thrive and, and be useful, functional people which I'm very happy to say that's the greatest gift I could receive on Father's Day, and I certainly have that right now. So, yeah, super cool. Thank you. Yeah, so 
the patterns in Florida are predictable without the rain, we are in trouble here because of the fact that, um, you know, this is a latitude that commonly has deserts just due to the way that the, the weather patterns, I suppose, work on Earth. But Florida has the great advantage of being surrounded by giant bodies of warm water. I, that's why I like it so much, actually. And um, that means that from the west coast of Florida and from the east coast of Florida, there's this like a uh, sandwiching effect of storms and winds, sea breezes really, they collect in the center of the state, somewhere like the Orlando area, and then typically they fall eastward towards where I'm at, giving us lots of rain, which is why everything looks so green and lush. If you see some of the videos in the winter time here, it can almost look like, you know, everything's dying and it's just, that's what winter looks like here. Things just get dry, the dry season. Look at that squirrel. These squirrels are so tame in our backyard. They're well fed, well provisioned. And uh, you know what these squirrels know? They know to not be on the ground when those chickens come around. <laughs> those chickens, are my, our sweet little hen bots. The fluffy butt brigade, brigade is they're murderers. They, they will kill anything that comes into their zone that is smaller than them. I'm convinced of it. And if something tries to attack any one of them, they all come in and attack that thing back. They tagged a possum pretty well. The possum got some bites in on one hand, but I don't know how that match would have gone between the possum. It was a full-size possum and uh, one of our small hens. They're actually kind of like a bantam breed, which is like the word for smaller types of chicken breeds. But whoa! That bluebird is constantly in the yard. It flew right by my head. I think it almost landed on my hat. I've got this hat on today. Now that's a hat. <laughs> Purely functional shade canopy for my face. But the, the hens defend their own. They may have a pecking order experience most of the time with each other, but when there's a threat, they know exactly what to do. I'm convinced there is no thought involved at that moment. Let's do this in chicky chant. Yeah, chick chick. We spend a lot of time with our chickens and I'm not afraid to admit it. <laughs> we love these little creatures. And they are, well, I guess about a year old, maybe a little longer. Very healthy, very happy. They've been great pets, that's for sure. And of course, having the five eggs a day doesn't hurt either. And uh, those are excellent eggs. Hey, if you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. That helps me. Get these videos out to more people, I think. That's something like a belief and an idea I have no way to verify. But I'm going to claim it's possible. Yeah, so... <laughs> yeah, the portable shade, says Gerald Franz. That's right. I've decided now, I, I used to kind of scoff at these types of hats, but now I've decided, no, this is the, the right way. <laughs> There's no other way. I, I can do so many things with this hat that I don't, the baseball hat would never get me. I'm gonna illustrate a, a concept here, which is just simply that I, I'm in a, a rough environment in terms of, this is just below the surface, this is just sand. And anything else that you see there that is not sand is because I've been enriching it, but also the salt and the environment and the winds and you know all that kind of stuff presents a challenging environment so there's only certain types of things that will grow here and which is why quite frankly in this area why a lot of people just kind of give up on on uh, growing more creative and food things they think well it's not possible you know i had a neighbor i gave a few fruit trees to he goes man they all died 
what do you mean? I said, did you get water? And he goes, yeah. Oh, did you put them in the, or the sprinkler, your sprinkler system, your salty irrigation water? We hit them, yeah, yeah, okay. Well, that killed, yeah, that would kill them all. So not knowing things like that and how to mitigate those factors, people have all kinds of failures. And I'm sure it happens in every growing environment. I don't think this is unique to here. There's the challenge set and learning to adapt to them. So look around, what does nature do? Just put stuff everywhere, put thing there, put thing there, put stuff everywhere and where it's viable, it'll grow and things that aren't viable won't grow. So that's in a nutshell, the philosophical approach I use. This was jammed in the ground. This is a mulberry, uh, ever bearing mulberry. They make great, well, first of all, the fruit's excellent. Small mulberries, but very tasty, tart, delicious. And it makes a great chop and drop crop. I've been doing that a lot. You can see all this stuff. I'll show you that. Well, I'll try to remember to show you the chop and drop area. I'm building up and I'm really committed to chop and drop now, but in order to do chop and drop, you have something to chop and drop. I'm using mulberry now as, as one of those. Right before it rains, I'll typically go and take some cuttings off of the one of the main mulberry trees that I like the flavor the most of the fruit. And then I'll put those around. So I just jammed a stick in here. You can see it had a you know, two two branches on it. Just jammed it in there nice and deep right before a rainstorm and then it torrential down pulled it for hours. And uh, it's growing. You know, there you go. Uh, this was a moringa tree that actually died off. Well, the, the top of it died off because it got snapped over by a windstorm and then it got too cold when the new shoots died. And it I just, the top of it, all of it died. I just bent it over, threw it, thought it was done. Nope, here it comes. Shoots from, directly from the root stock itself. I mean, the root that was under the ground that was left. I mean, I thought that tree was a goner. So if it's meant to be there, it's gonna be there. Look at this, you know what this is? Anybody on, anybody on the stream? Go ahead, you can shoot it up in the chat if you know what this is. This bizarre vine-like cactus, which you will find. Oh, oh, you thought you were gonna get treats. I know, don't get upset. There's more here. You can see I'm illustrating this concept, which is just the plant stuff all over. You could always pull it up if you decide that's not the place with some exceptions. But look at this, look at this. I planted some here and yeah, one's not really doing it. It's starting to turn yellow, but this one, oh, oh, look. Attaching itself to the fence. That's what I wanted to do. This is the ivy of, yes, Gerald Franz is correct. It is dragon fruit. This is a yellow dragon fruit variety I have in the front yard and I made a lot of videos about it. Check them out if you're interested. About, you know, the how to's. That's right. Florida 561 Mom, Florida. Oh, FL 561 Mom, Florida. Dragon fruit. You got it. <laughs> you got it. Perfect. I love that username too. That's cool. The beautiful state of Florida. It's a state of mind as well, perhaps. But yeah, so look at how it's growing up there. Garden of Twitty. So great to see you on the stream, man. Welcome, welcome. And thanks for all those great comments over on Jedi Jingle Maker. Stoked on that, that some people are enjoying the original music that I'm putting on that channel. By the way, if you're interested in, <laughs> a little promo, if you're interested in uh, checking out my original music, I play electric guitar and I compose music, you know, using keyboard, MIDI keyboard. And uh, you might like it. People have referred to it as trance-like. I don't know what that means exactly, but maybe it'll tr entrance you. Oh, come on, come on, come on, come on. There's no reason. There's simply no reason for that level of nonsense. Yeah, so we've got, by the way, yeah, Moringa, exactly. Uh -oh, I might have to, I might have to provide them with something to keep their mind off of being hungry now. But yeah. If you have something you want to see in the backyard, I've got all kinds of fruit trees and plants back here. If you have something you're interested in, we can walk right over to it. I have this gimbal now, so we have nice, smooth motion. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the Moringa tree itself is such a great, great chop drop tree. It's 
kind of tree loves to be trimmed. I recently decided to commit to planting several in the yard. This one is an example of two. two there are two moringa seeds that I planted right next to each other in a pot, and then I replanted it here. FL561 Mom Florida says, Everglades tomato, great for hot weather. Oh, absolutely. I totally agree with that. Um, I got some some little $1 plants of, of Florida Everglades and also I think what they call Seminole cherry tomatoes from, uh, from Funky Chicken Farms out in Palm Bay, Florida. By the way, uh, great place. Just a cool place if you're ever in the, this area. Malabar spinach, yeah. Absolutely. That's another great one. FL 561 Mom Florida. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll tell you what, if you took away from the stream just the things that uh, FL 561 Mom brought up here in the last minute, you're better for it because um, these are going to be winners. You can mess around with the varieties you get at the, you know, Lowe's and so on and so forth, the department store, but uh, the varieties that are intended to grow in this environment are really going to do much, much better. Yeah, so here's another one of those Florida mulberries. Sometimes they're slow to start up. Another one just jammed it in the ground here. It, it kind of had a lean on it, so I shorted up with these, with this fiberglass rod. By the way, I've really, this is the, I'm not trying to sell fiberglass rods, but this one, I, you know, this is the question. How do you secure your thing to keep it standing up well at the time i didn't have a bunch of oak branches now i have a lot of oak branches look at these oak logs here this is not my permanent setup i've laid them there because these things are incredibly heavy that thing's probably 60 pounds 70 pounds i'm not even joking it's crazy heavy but um yeah the point is how do you keep these plants standing up straight and these fiberglass miracle grow rods seem to work pretty well initially now none of these have been tested over a year so you know i'm going to claim that right about year two outside maybe year three these things are going to start to shed fiberglass which means that when you touch them or if you rub your arm against them like that's the classic to get it on the inside of your arm where the skin's more sensitive that it'll shed fiberglass and be an issue but we'll see at that point if it does that i'm getting rid of them now i have so much oak wood wow i paid to have my oak tree, my gigantic, I think it's a live oak tree in my front yard, trimmed by a professional, the guy who did my neighbor's tree, did an excellent job, and wow, he did an amazing job. He estimated he took 9,000 pounds of weight out of that tree. I'm going to be releasing a video where I show the before and after, but you know, if you have a big oak tree on your property, you know, that's a force to be reckoned with. That's something you're going to have to deal with eventually or not deal with and deal with it when it deals with you because during a hurricane those suckers can tip over and uh, they have root pans that are at least as wide as the canopy of the tree so you and it's all hardwood so when they tip over it lifts up everything it can lift up a house it's incredible so you know i got to think about those things because we're getting close to hurricane season if you're in florida or maybe new to florida we got a lot of new floridians a lot coming still as well and uh you know the whole hurricane thing i would say if you're new don't don't sweat it just get prepared to the maximum extent and realize that everything you have can be taken away at a moment's notice this is the philosophical exercise of hurricanes as soon as you arrive at that point you're free <laughs> and that's what the hurricane is here to teach us that all this we're looking at can be taken from us in a moment and then the other part of it is it's going to immediately come back. It's, it's just going to be an opportunity for it all to be new again. So, you know, I've had this yard flattened many times by hurricanes that have gone through. And look at this. It's doing great. So, yeah, the, the oak branches that we harvested from the tree out front though i i worked it out with the uh, guy that he would just get them into small pieces and, and place them around and so we've i've located this you know, look at this as stored in permaculture in a permaculture sense 
stored energy. These oak logs all represent incredible energy. Like Gerald was saying, the red oak for the using for grilling or, or cooking out or campfires or whatever. There's no better firewood than this. This is so incredibly dense. So it's going to last for well over a decade on the ground like this. Once you put these logs, if all you do with them is just put them on the ground, I know some people might think, oh, well, does that gonna, is that gonna draw in termites? The termites are already here. The termites are here. We cannot hide from the termites. When I was young and more stupid than I am now, I paid for like a decent amount of money to have somebody come in and treat my house for termites. You know why? Because I believed that I could play a role in controlling termites. That's a foolish perspective, my friends. You know how you play a role in controlling termites? Build your house out of concrete. Yep, that's how you do it. So, it turns out my house is made out of concrete blocks, so really never even needed it. Sure, they can get up through a hole and get into the rafters, but it's incredibly unlikely in my estimation. So all this wood gonna return back. That's right, Garden of Twitty. Returning the energy right on back. Under all of these areas, you're gonna find worms in very short order, I know, because Jack and his friends will be searching out the worms because they are the most tasty treat that you can feed a, a chicken, the worm. The early bird got the worm. All right, now look at this. This look at this type of situation. It, I mean, it doesn't look great to have this weedy look in your thing, but I'm, I don't mind it now. It looks like healthiness to me now. Um, yeah, the, the idea of, is this a problem? Well, no, it isn't. This is St. Augustine grass. Look at that. That is a vegetable. What loves to eat St. Augustine grass, which has been fertilized with bunny turds and no artificial stuff whatsoever? Chickens. This is a chicken vegetable garden. See what I'm saying? I probably won't put some Italian vinaigrette on that and eat it for dinner, but those chickens will love it so much. And you don't need to believe me because I'm gonna go feed these chickens. <laughs> All right, yeah, there we are. A little handful of the greens. I want you to check out what the chickies do. I don't think I'll need to call them because they're tracking my every step. They see that I was picking vegetables like this. <laughs> Look at that. You think they like it? They're using the pecking order to keep some of them from getting to it. Look at that. They're going to fight over it. Yeah, that's how you know they love it. Now, I just chuck it in and let them have at it. But that's what I'm talking about. It's that simple. I know it sounds kind of hippy dippy woo woo, but. You really mostly have to just get out of the way and figure out what the flow of natural things are and fit in it. And you come to realize the more you muck with it, the more you probably screw it up. What are the simple, what are the fundamentals? What are the first principles of getting your yard or anything, any place functioning and producing for you? Food, entertainment, you know, all that. And it's gonna be the same thing pretty much everywhere. Enough sunlight, enough water, the right kind of soil, nutrients, all of that kind of stuff. If you're tending to that, and that took me a little while to figure out how to do it, and I'm gonna give the shout out right now. I'm not, I don't have any kind of a business relationship with Funky Chicken Farms, but I'm a big fan because they changed my life in terms of my backyard, my approach and the productivity of everything by, well, I thought I wanted chickens. I was going to look at chickens. It turns out they had bunny. And I discovered the Zen art of culture bunny ownership. If you don't have bunnies, you know, I, I just posted a video not too long ago called bunnies will change your life. Um, <laughs> and it's true. They will, if nothing more, they're going to change your backyard life. 
I'm gonna show you, and I, you know, I like to do this. Show you the old bunny setup. You see my son, my friend made that for me in exchange for eggs. Another permaculture. Whoa. Hey there, Penelope. You're hungry. Oh, you're ready for breakfast. You ready to get down to exercise? Yeah, she's such a sweetheart. Okay. If I lose connectivity, it's because I'm under all this roof stuff and I'll, I'll regain it quickly by walking out and reestablishing. Okay, how you doing, sweetie? Yeah, you want You see this? This is the, the, the submissive position of a rabbit. You see how she put her head down right away and just waits to be pet? She had no fear. They're such, they've received nothing but affection, love, exercise, excellent food their whole life. And they're just wonderful pets. Just so wonderful. Penelope will let you hold her for as long as you want to hold her pretty much. She's such a wonderful lion head rabbit. Little tiny rabbit producing lots of sweet manure. That may look like gross to some people, but if you know what I know, there's few things more valuable in this world than really good fertilizer. All right, now I just want to take a commercial break and say, please also support the other cool channels that that I interface with. Uh, David Good, the Survival Channel, Gardner Twitty, certainly. Um, James Palms and, and many others. So I'd say check them out. I like the uh, this a lot. I really get a lot back from interacting and I hope you do too. I would say like if one person gets a benefit, that's enough. In fact, one person already did get a benefit, which is me. But yeah, so these bunnies are constantly producing the bunny manure and I'm constantly putting it in the yard and that is constantly giving me results like this. All right, uh, the sun's a little bright here, but let's look to see, Can you see that? I'm, I've been petting the bunnies. I'm just gonna try to get the picking it one-handed. Right, here we go. All right. So that get it in the light where you can see it. I hope. Okay, that is a brown turkey fig. Great variety of fig. I've expanded it. The, my fig collection quite a bit this year. You can see what they look like when they're ripe, but I have not produced figs of this quality ever before. Oh, awesome. Gardner Twitty's got a video this morning. Yep, you know I'll be there for that. And now that you told me about it, I'm going to be there. Awesome. Yeah, so the, the fig, the brown turkey fig is excellent. They taste better because of the bunny manure. I'm sure of it. I'm gonna try it. Okay, this is the Eat Your Backyard part of the Eat Your Backyard channel where we actually eat the backyard. And then show. That's what it looks like inside. One issue with these figs is that the, this particular variety of fig is they can, the ends of them can open up as they get very ripe or they get a lot of rain on this when they're fruiting, so. You know, you want to pick them before that happens. Once that happens, the flies and things will get inside and you, you don't want that. Wow, that's good. Now, talked about a chicken garden. If you've got pampered chickens like mine, they get a lot of fresh fruit. All right, let's see here. I'll try to pick one that's not as pretty. Here's one. Oh, it down exactly like I thought it would. But once they start coming in, yeah, they're just figs everywhere. There's enough for the chickens, the squirrels, me, Jack. Hold on, yards, but these chickens know exactly. Go ahead, give me a thumbs up if you like watching chickens be fed figs. All right, all right. See how happy chickens are quiet chickens? 
they can't they can't cackle when they have a beak full of figs they can just coo now funny thing is about feeding chicken yeah once they pulled it out of my hand <laughs> there you go yeah figs oh this is kind of interesting the sex of papaya plants they're they are male and female and the uh the flower of the male is multi-flowered and they come in a long stalk that's how you can tell it's a male so this particular papaya that i've grown in a pot you see it is a male that means it will pollinate females and i don't think that's a bad thing i used to think ah, oh, do you want too many seeds it will produce more seeds i suppose more viable seeds in your papaya you're gonna have male plants around anyway um you know, so you're not going to get an unpollinated papaya in my neighborhood because there's plenty of people growing male papayas around. Papayas will grow in even drought situations. Once they get started, they're very easy to grow. So that's one of the plants you will see around here. The fruit's kind of so-so. I, I don't know. If you like papayas, I like them. But it's not the kind of thing like you're just dying to have a papaya, whereas I would be dying to have this sweet mango. I've got, I think, one more mango sitting up in this Tommy Atkins mango tree. We had a pretty light harvest of mangoes this year because I did a lot of trimming. But, uh, yeah, the papaya. So there's almost always papaya coming in. We recently had a lot of cherry growth. We're at the end uh, of, but the cherry seasons on both the Barbados and the Suriname cherry have passed. We had a bumper crop of mulberries from this mulberry tree and others, but that seems to have paused. It's an ever-bearing tree, so it'll it'll uh, start to produce again. Oh, yeah, and so as we come into summer, one of the wind, one of the storms came through and blew the door off the hinges. So I've got just a temporary screen there, but I've got to replace the. The fencing, we've also got fence issues over in the chicken pen area, so I think I'll hire somebody to come re-fence. Look at this moringa tree, which I've grown in a pot. That was from a cutting, so I try these in many different ways. FL561 Mom says, going to get some fig trees, need your channel, love your content. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that compliment greatly. I really do. Awesome. Yeah. Stoked. Hope you sub and join us in the future. So, yeah, I like to grow the trees in a couple different ways. The two ways being, well, there's a lot of ways. As a matter of fact, I was watching uh, Gardner Twitty's air grafting video. It motivated me to do that. I'm going to start to try to do that as well. So, but, you know, two basic ways are from a cutting, from a seed. So, this moringa tree was grown from a cutting. It was grown actually from a cutting I took off of that, that plant I showed you over there, the multi-trunk. And uh, wow, did it take off. So now it's about probably four and a half feet tall, doing very well. You see how leggy it gets? That's a characteristic of the Moringa that you should be aware of if you don't have any, you wanna know about them. Um, they get very leggy, So, but they love to be trimmed. However, if you over trim them when they're too young, you can stunt them. So there's a few things to, I think, I mean, being stunt, you know, make them just slow down to the point where it's irritating. So, this one I'm letting get leggy. I think the thing is to let it get, you know, tall, healthy, strong, and then cut it way back and just keep doing that. And then it has the root system to support that and it's more or less like a vegetable. You can eat the fruit off of this as well. I think it tastes gross. Personally, it has about the nutritional benefit of broccoli. So, you know, if you, if you didn't have other food, it would be pretty good to have, but it's also full of nutrients you can just chop and drop right back in. So I told you I was gonna talk about a little bit of my chop and drop commitment. You know, if you follow permaculture practices, try to implement them, whatever the, I would call them principles. Um, you'll see a lot about returning the energy back into the soil, but chop and drop is just such a great way to do that where you're intentionally growing things for the purpose of harvesting them and laying them on the ground and then everything else is done automatically. You can see here we've got uh, palms, we've got 
grape leaf, uh, sea grape leaves, sorry, that eluded me there for a moment. Um, Moringa cutting certainly throughout. We've got this Jamaican cherry. I've got others. So a lot of different things. I just layer them up and layer them up. And you find as you do this, you don't have enough stuff to cover everything. And what you want is, meaning I find, but you, I'm getting there as a lot of, I'll show you how I've set myself up to get more things to be able to chop and drop. It creates a fun thing too, to be able to constantly just be trimming around the yard, walking around with the clippers. I, I like to do that. It's kind of a real meditative practice. So, but look at this, this is a combination of some uh, Suriname cherries and banana leaves and loquat leaves and mango leaves. And I just keep piling, piling, piling. And it created a pretty big heap, which was significantly higher two weeks ago. And I've just noticed the effect of everything sucking it down to the earth. It will disintegrate it and everything will be returned to the soil here. Maybe not on the time scale of like a you know a week or five months, but over the course of a year, that's going to pretty much be just a just dust. And I know that because I've watched things over the years for so long, and it's just to get that stuff down on the ground so that the natural process can can do its its job. And this is a janky pile of pile of uh, sticks, right? It's there for a purpose, though. And the fungus, the various, yeah, I mean, there's a whole life form, a whole universe of life, which is constantly growing on this stuff that's breaking it down. You see this very cool fungus, this white that grows on it? Nothing is required to make that happen other than put it on the ground. Look at that back in that corner. Isn't that beautiful? It's just amazing. The fungus breaking down the wood and the bacteria all working and doing their things. Can I explain it or understand it? I don't know. I mean, I understand I need to get out of the way and provide just the basic environment for this stuff to work. I do have to add some things like water. Water is the primary thing I have to stay up on here. And if it's getting watered like it did yesterday, heavily, well, then we're in good shape. But if not, then I need to make sure I'm watering it so it doesn't get too dry in the summertime and get burned or die in some way. That's the risk. And the other thing is to make sure it continues to get sunlight. So as these things take off, you're giving them bunny manure. They're really getting vigorous. Well, you get into situations where like this, this, uh, uh, well, it's a, it's a form of lychee. It's a longan fruit tree. This longan fruit tree is growing over these dwarf bananas that I have here. So I trim it and chop and drop it right there. But yeah, the shade management in a small space is something I talk about a lot, something I do a lot. And the chop and drop thing fits right in with that as well. So I'm really just managing the who gets how much of the sun. My dwarf coconut tree is doing quite well. Did suffer through some white fly infestation I've talked about a bit, but it definitely came back. Uh, I watched a very in interesting David the Good video recently that talked about clearing an area and how to reestablish a kind of good soil health there. And, and the idea was plant cover crop and that the roots, the process of the plants growing in there provides uh, a rich environment that is a great way to get an area growing. Now, that was really interesting to me. And it makes perfect sense, but it's a real paradigm shift that lines up with the shift I've already been taking, which is plant stuff all over the place. And I'm not even talking about just all the fruity things we like to grow, but also planting, like for instance, I harvest now dandelion seeds. That's right. So we had a when I see a big area of dandelions on the side of my house where I've let it kind of get, uh, I, I don't do much, but they just, they just happen to appear there. I collect the seeds and I sprinkle them around. Not, not everywhere, because I don't want dandelions necessarily growing everywhere, but I do want them growing for sure. Oh, thank you, Pedro. Rhea, I'm gonna try to pronounce this correctly, hold on. I, the comment disappeared as soon as I tried to read it. Okay.
Pedros Rios de Almeida. Yeah, coconut looks amazing. Amazing. Thank you, Pedro. I appreciate that greatly. I'm quite pleased with uh, its current state. I'm hoping that will continue. The dwarf variety fits in very well here. I had some, you know, so many logs that I had to just pile some of them here. I don't really know. Ah, Portuguese. Okay, yeah. I like it. So, I planted a lot of dandelions. And look at this. Good old dandelion. This is a rabbit's delight. Dandelion sprouts that have not sprouted yet. Flower sprouts. And you can go through and harvest these like you would any vegetable. Now this is a, well, the chickens will eat these too, but this is a rabbit garden. And we have these all over and all my kids and their friends love to come and pick some rabbit greens. Rabbit heaven. That's rabbit heaven. If you were to taste it, you'd probably make a face that looks like you just did something wrong because it tastes horrible. But to a chicken and a rabbit, this is like Maine lobster dipped in butter and breadcrumbs. All right. All right. That's a nice little harvest, isn't it? Something right out of the survival hand guide. Let's see here, Pinnells. We didn't bring you your breakfast yet, really, but we'd like to feed you some fresh grains. You like that? Think she likes it? I feel like it's important not just, just to feed them the... Okay. Yeah, not just to feed them the granular stuff, but to... You know, I, I really would like to eventually just feed them from things from the yard, but I don't know if that's practical. I don't want to malnourish them in some way because I don't give them enough. They're, they're wind, wandering around the yard. Oh, there you go, Thumper. Thumper nose. That's all right, hold on, buddy. We actually, back up. We actually leave these cage doors open during the day. They, they never try to jump out. They just kind of sit up there. But that way we can always combine pet them and easily get them out to exercise. See how he goes down that submissive posture. Here you go, little Thumper. Thumper's like a teddy bear. Yeah, here. There you go. Yep. Okay. I'm gonna get to the comments here in just a second, but I'll just point out a couple other things. If you're familiar with the channel, you've seen a lot of these things before, but it's, I'm thinking nice to see an update and see how things progress. It's part of the, the idea here, but this is a pigeon pea, another prime specimen. If you do not have pigeon peas, you should ask yourself, why do I not have pigeon peas? And you might have a perfectly great answer to that question. My answer was, oh, I didn't know about pigeon peas. So once I knew about them, I planted them and now I love it. This has been a, such a keystone plant in my yard. We pick these pigeon peas and single creature in this yard loves them including me and they've just been growing back and growing back and I've expanded the pigeon peas where they're planted it's like a perennial pea tree and the, the, the peas are prolific they just keep coming and coming and coming the flowers that produce the peas are beautiful I think they look something like a snapdragon I mean look at this it's like just crazy beautiful and when they come in, they really come in. Now, this is about the fifth or sixth fruiting of this thing. It just keeps coming in. Little branches will die off. We trim them off, and they just it just keeps coming. So I've expanded those greatly because of the utility of the pigeon pea. I'd recommend it for you as well. I think they're a nitrogen-fixing plant, too, which is good to fix the nitrogen in the soil, stabilize your situation and by using the root power. Root power, man. This is something I planted to be inedible for the chickens, and wow, do they love it. Uh, sorry, not for the chickens, for the rabbits. That's lemongrass. It just continues to go. I need to plant some more lemongrass and get it started in various areas of the yard. But everything loves to eat the lemongrass, the chickens, the rabbits, me. And this sugar cane, this is red sugar cane. Sugar cane's another great add for your yard. Very easy to grow. Clump, it's all, You think of it almost like a clumping bamboo, I would. Um, you know, it's incredibly beautiful. 
I have several varieties of it. At one point I had four varieties of it. I, get, I tend to go a little overboard <laughs> on plants, as you might have noticed. Um, but look at that. That's like 12 foot high grass. And you could go buy hay for your rabbits because rabbits require constant hay. Or you could just rip off pieces of gigantic sugarcane leaf, which they love and is very fibrous, and use that as the hay. So that's what we're doing. I don't plan on buying more hay. I plan, I plan on making sure they constantly have, constantly have enough fresh hay. So these leaves packed with nutrition for the for the bunny because they've been fertilized with the bunny turds. Not that. Oh look, she's about ready to jump out of the cage to get to this. Yeah, you like that? You like that? Yeah, it's funny because they get so hungry they rush out and then when they see your hand come in they get in that submissive pose and they. Oh, you missed it. Yeah. Right over here. Right over here. You yeah, have great eyesight. As odd as that sounds. Here you go, though. It's like, Penelope, due to your enthusiasm, you win the second sugar cane leaf. So this is just a good example of a little system. That, and by the way, this is part of the system, the, the chill bench. Used all the time, gotta have it. That is a, this is a place where the whole family loves to come all the time, enjoy the bunnies, play with the bunnies. You know, we put the bunnies down on the ground here. As a matter of fact, I would do that, but they just started eating the sugar cane I think I'll leave them up there but the, the, really the time to let them out is after the sea breezes kick up a little bit because it's so hot they if you let them down in the middle of the day they just go sit somewhere which is kind of nice but I think they'd probably rather sit in their cage to be honest because they get total airflow from all sides there oh by the way we keep track of the heat zone one of the questions we get is is it too hot for the bunnies and the answer is no it's not too hot for the bunnies but it's hot it's hot. That's 90 in the, you know, partial sun. So you can see it's getting sun. So yeah, that's not a good indicator, but I'd say it's probably 85 in the shade, 82 maybe. Uh, if it gets crazy hot, we usually put some ice cubes out there, but these bunnies were raised in Florida, born in Florida, born to generations of bunnies that have lived in Florida. So again, there's really not a lot you have to do. Make sure that they're you know, we go the extra mile by making sure they can exercise and all that kind of stuff. That makes it way more fun for us, too. I'm going to show you something else, but first I'm going to look back at the comments to make sure I didn't miss any. I appreciate you posting the comments, and I don't want to miss any of those. Okay, so, FL561 Mom, Florida says... What do you suggest for mold on my cucumber? Yeah. What do you suggest for mold, I guess, is the bigger question. Um, you know, I suggest, first of all, less water and more sunlight. You know, that you think of just the basic things which naturally eradicate mold. It's going to be not, not constant... Uh, water, humidity, and availability of sunlight. So you can provide those two things. I think you probably would be in the right zone. I definitely wouldn't put any kind of anti-mold chemical or anything on them. Um, if it's some kind of pest issue that's causing some kind of failure that causes them to then become moldy in some way, I, I would recommend something like neem oil to get a pure neem oil and, and mix it yourself to spray on things that seems to work pretty well and be a natural solution i certainly used it on this coconut tree right here to solve the white fly and ringworm infestation it definitely had when it was little it's grown through that and it's probably still got a few little white flies on it but it's strong enough now to take care of itself so there's my suggestion on that thank you for the comment oh Gardner Twitty, looks like he checked out out there in West Texas. 
Love that. And uh, he's going to come back, watch the rest. I appreciate it. Oh, and he said, gave a shout out to Jedi Jingle Maker. Yes, thank you very much, Garden Twitty. Jedi Jingle Maker. Yes, please, everybody, if you can, if you want to do something nice for me today, I'm stoked. I can't believe it. It's awesome. And that thing would be go subscribe to Jedi Jingle Maker. It's at like 20, 27 subscribers now. It's not a place I'm monetizing videos or anything like that. It's just where I'm putting my artwork out for you guys to enjoy. And I'd love to get your feedback on it, see if you like it. So far, the feedback's been good, but um, yeah, you know, I play guitar, I make weird sounds. Hope you go to Jedi Jingle Maker and plug your ear caves into this word bird stew. James Tropicals, we were, <laughs> thank you. Good to see you on the stream. Got, got a moderator on the stream. Just giving a shout out to your channel my friend, along with David the Good, Garden Twitty, and others. I haven't seen uh, a few of the regulars haven't been around recently, but you know, eventually they come back. All right, and Pedro was asking, uh, do you chew them? And I think he was asking that question when I was by the uh, sugarcane plant, which is pretty interesting. I had never thought of it. Uh, if well, I guess my question would be, is that what you meant by chew them? Yeah, the sugar cane. No, I, I don't chew them. I haven't tried it. I would actually be interested in, in actually trying that because it's a sugar cane plant after all. And I always had a theory uh, as I saw how much the rabbits d dig into them. It's awesome. Okay, you know it's awesome already. Well, then I'm definitely trying it. Because, yeah, it, it seemed to me that they would be very sugary. Like, even a regular St. Augustine blade of grass doesn't taste that bad. I chewed on one of those. When I was a kid, we used to chew on hay all the time. You know, I grew up on a farm, and the sweetness of, like, a, a wheat stalk, for instance, is very nice. You say, we used to also go and find honeysuckle quite a bit because there are a lot of honeysuckle vines growing and, and drink the, the, uh, the nectar of the honeysuckle flower one drop at a time. Mm, that was good. So I haven't tried it. I think I'll probably wash these off before I try them. I have machines for turning it into juice. Interesting. Oh, you must not be talking about the leaf. You must be talking about the cane itself. But still, I'd be curious to see how a sugar cane leaf tastes. But I think the cane itself, yeah. So I do chew the sugar cane. Yep, absolutely. These are all chewing cane varieties, meaning the stalks of the sugar cane are, I'll walk over to a green variety. Yeah, yeah, the cane. Okay, sorry, I was confused. Yeah, the uh, sugar cane itself, we, we chew, absolutely. My favorite variety of chew is the, meaning, and when I say chew sugar cane, for those of you who aren't familiar with, you know, how to eat sugar cane, uh, it consists of, with the chewing cane varieties, which are typically pretty fibrous down the, down the stalk, and they kind of hold together, so after, um, anyway, is to take the outside skin off and then chew the center part. That's a great, traditional food in many countries. Uh, when I was in Jamaica at the, at the uh, years ago when I was a kid, we went to go see Star Wars, believe it or not. Ni it was like 1978 in Jamaica, wild. Went to see Star Wars in a movie theater that did not have a roof on purpose. It was an open air movie theater. It was awesome. It was awesome. And in the, in the, um, in the lobby, they sold freshly peeled sugar cane and it was incredible so that you can chew on during the movie. So anyway, the point is that you take this outer layer off and you can chew it, just kind of crunch it in your mouth and you get the juice out of it. And you can juice the whole thing and you're left with this fibrous like piece of stuff. You just chuck it. This is Florida, what they call around here, Florida green sugar cane. Hey, Brampton Gardener, good morning. Good to see you on the stream, stoked you're here. We're looking at some Florida green sugar cane and uh, I guess you could call it Florida yellow sugar cane, but this time of year is where you typically see a lot of new sprouts due to all the water. But you know, it's coming in at various times depending on when you stubble the last clump of sugar cane. This one's growing right out of the right out of a banana clump. You see, <laughs> look at the size of this Musa banana, just to give you a perspective. It's getting big. Yeah. Very, very big. 
and right out of the center of it is growing this sugarcane clump. But this one's ready to harvest. And when you see this color, it's like seeing the fall colors in a leaf on a tree, places where you get winter, not here. That means the sugar is maturing and it's going to taste really good. You don't want to let it go too far past this because then it can start drying out. But each one of these, if you look carefully, has lots of little aerial roots preparing to sprout. And if you feel it, you can tell if it's viable, a little bud that a new sugarcane plant will grow out of. So if you want to plant this, you basically just cut it here, cut it here, you know, in between the nodes. And if you really want to make sure it works, you dip it in like some melted crayon wax or paraffin wax to seal up the ends. That way it doesn't desiccate and lose, lose the water. Plant it so that this is pointing up and they'll grow most of the time. Pretty easy to grow. Yeah. Brampton Gardner says the local Indian grocery store will juice sugar cane fresh and add lime juice and serves it over ice. It's so delicious. Wow. That sounds amazing. I've heard from some of the folks on the stream that the sugar cane press has come way down in price and that it's now affordable to get a sugar cane press. That would be something I wouldn't actually mind investing in. Another good thing is a sugar cane peeler. It almost looks like a giant carrot peeler to be able to do it yourself. But um, Brampton Gardner, you have definitely sparked my curiosity enough to think maybe I'll seek out a, a nature food store or even a local restaurant because we have a lot of Cuban restaurants uh, in Florida, certainly, and Puerto Rican restaurants that would might serve sugarcane juice with lime. That would be amazing. Even better, you put a little rum in that, you know, if that's your thing. And FL561 Mom Florida says, thank you for your help. We had so much rain lately. I'll definitely use the neem oil. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, thank you very much for that compliment. Uh, I, yeah, definitely am a fan of the neem oil. Uh, there are a lot of varieties of it, like you can get on Amazon. Just go check it out, look around. And there are like cold uh, pressed, you know, the pure stuff. But if you read the comments on the different varieties, you know, I would I just picked the one that a lot of people were saying worked well for the gardening application. And um, you don't, you know, if you get one bottle of it, you can make that go a long way. It smells like onions, you know, just to sum it up. I think that's the thing. My Aunt Mary, she uh, was a great woman and a great gardener, and she used a brew, which she shared with me willingly and anybody else who wanted to know, which was a concoction of, she would put, make this and then put it in spray bottles, and she sprayed it on her vegetable garden, and it really kept the pests down. You know, you never eliminate the pests, but kept them down. And that was a mix of dish soap, like, you know, Dawn dish soap, uh, a lot of like macerated crushed onions and garlic. You know, she was growing onions and garlic and so she had that all the time, ready to go. And uh, yeah, and then, then water, you know, and so those three ingredients and then sprayed that all over and everything smelled like onions. Yeah, but you know what, you don't see many pests in the onions and there's a reason is because the onion has chemicals in it that keep the pests away and that don't, you know, necessarily hurt you too much as far as I'm concerned. So, I know there's like anti-onion people in the world, you know. Stop the onion, the onion is against us. But uh, no, the onion's with us, firmly on our side. Neem oil, like an onion smell. And that is my theory as to why it might work well, but it's worked for me in the, in the applications I've used. Look at that monarch butterfly. Did you see that? Oh, we have so many butterflies. This is gonna sound like I'm making this up but they will land on our arms and stuff out here it's like a you know some kind of it really happens but when they come out we put our hands out and they'll land on our arms and all different types of butterflies are in the yard now i mean all kinds of things are in the yard now heck I, i'm now on the point where if i let these trees get to a certain point i, I can't trim them anymore because now they've got birds nests growing up and we've got birds nests in about eight of the trees in the backyard right now birds everywhere Chickens almost killed a baby bluebird, which was, uh, you know, nature doing its work. But that little bluebird fell down into the chicken cage, and those chickens went immediately to pecking it to death. And uh, we, I heard it going on, and I got over there and kind of shoot them away from the 
from the bluebird. Not like I'm gonna be a rescuer of nature or something in any significant way, but you know, I just don't like to see a baby bluebird peck to death right in front of me if I can help it. So uh, I, I didn't do anything beyond just kind of scare the chickens away. And then that bluebird kind of limped and limped and just had enough to fly up into the tree above. And funny thing is I've seen that bluebird and it's growing up. I don't know if it's that one that flew over here earlier in the stream, it could be, but it, that's when it was just a little, little thing where those chickens almost killed it. I think it stuck around. But now I knows how to exist with the chickens. Believe me, that bluebird will not casually land on the chicken pen floor again. But it will probably swoop down and grab a Barbados cherry as they fall. Okay, so I wanted to show you guys one more thing, but I want to check the comments first. Again, I do appreciate the comments very much. And I don't want to miss any. <laughs> okay, Brampton Gardner says, yeah, don't look too much. You'll never leave the leave the washroom that's right exactly I, i'm with you right be a be a man of action be a person of action they'd be probably be happy to juice yours for you too that's right yeah that's a better solution exactly rather than uh, this is such the urge my urge which i trying to pay attention to which is to create these complicated systems around everything and uh there's really not that much of a need and it's could be summed up as some level of neuroticism why not just take a pile of that sugar cane over and enjoy the novelty of doing that, bringing your crop to the place. Maybe you give them, you know, you come with two varieties and you give them, you know, the sugar cane to keep afterwards and see if you could even do a trade. You never know. That, by the way, that whole trade ski thing, you know, uh, we used to call it the Yui 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 because when my kids were little, when my two oldest children, Jonathan and Julia were little, they would, uh, before they had either, either of them had mastered speaking English, they had developed a system which we, my wife and I would laugh so hard where they could negotiate the exchange of toys and they made this word called Yui. And so one of them would say, they'd hold the toy out and go, Yui, Yui, Yui. And they would go, Yui? And they would, and they would just non-verbally almost just with sounds negotiate the, the peaceful exchange of toys. It was awesome. So sharing. <laughs> Well, not sharing necessarily, trading, let's say, you know, where everybody gets something. This is awesome. If like all points on the network were strong and operating strong, we all had a, the maximum personal strength, individual strength we could muster. We were all shooting to the highest goal we could envision. We were all saying no when we need to say no to nonsense. We were all doing, you know, identifying the stupid things we do and just trying to pick one of them to solve in a row. If we were all doing that, we would have something to share for sure. In fact, we would have nothing but abundance and a bounty of abundance to exchange. Everybody would benefit from that kind of situation where everybody is individually strong. You see what I'm saying? Well, at least I see what I'm saying. So it seems like the whole concept of permaculture and trading things is an excellent one and very natural to the experience of life. In fact, actually a very good sign of, the, of a healthy experience in life is to be exchanging value between nodes in a network. That sounds great. And you could trade maybe sugarcane for sugarcane juice. That seems like a good trade. Okay, it looks like FL Mama 561 got to her location. And, but she'll be back. Thank you. Excellent. And Brampton Gardener, I completely agree that Rome goes well with everything. Yes. Um, so I would ask on the stream what kind of rum and what color. Because one does not just say rum. Well, one does just say rum. And it's like, what kind of rum? All right, here we go. What do we have here? What do we have here? This is a very interesting leaf structure, to say the least, in my opinion. Very common. Leaf structure in many plants. This is a tamarind tree, which I grew from seed. I struggled with growing tamarind for years. I eventually just bought a tamarind plant at a nursery, two of them which were sweet tamarind. These, I eventually figured out how to grow tamarind from a seed. And I, uh, I think I made a video about that, but I could make a video about it if you're interested. It was challenging, but it was worth it. This one I grew for the last 
year or so, year and a half or so, and I finally got big enough to plant it. Now this is another one where I planted two seeds next to each other. And uh, I think that's okay. But this is a sour tamarind, and I also have the sweet tamarind. These are cold sensitive plants, but this tree can actually get kind of large. So again, it becomes a chop and drop candidate very quickly. And it's also exhibiting the, the characteristics of plants grown from seed, which is a vigorous growth, a vigorous growth. If you're growing a fruit tree from a seed, it's typically gonna be much more vigorous than if you had grown it from a, from a uh, cutting, which this is a tree grown from a cutting. This is a sweet tamarind. I'm talking about seeds, similar, similar leaf structure, just really getting started. Planted it in a partial shade spot here on purpose under this mango tree, which is a whole other thing. I'm gonna stubble this. I think I'm. that's a topic for a future video, but stubbling of the giant Hayden mango tree, I think must occur, and it must occur prior to heavy winds because the thing is just too big and it's near power lines. Well, okay, I would like to say, if you are not subscribed to Jedi Jingle Maker, please do it. If you're not subscribed to Eat Your Backyard, please do it. If you like this type of content, please give a thumbs up. And if you are, on the stream at this point in the stream i just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for your participation in this i love it uh, please don't hesitate to leave a comment uh, also i plan to be back on with uh, more traditional content starting this week i've got many videos that are in the making and uh, i think you'll enjoy them my standard eclectic mix of topics just like this stream. So I would encourage you to go ahead and plant something. You know, get out of the way of abundance in your zone. Just get out of the way. That's the idea and the main thought. Oh, that's cool. I'm gonna read James Tropical's comment. Just got a grafted Malika mango tree from Everglades Farm. Oh, that's killer. Yeah, you see my three new mango trees? One, two, three. That's a fair child. And then these are two patio mangoes, different varieties. But yeah, lots of mangoes. We've got to have mangoes. All right, thanks for watching, everybody. I appreciate you.